Hi, I'm Sabin Yakov. This presentation is entitled Troubleshooting Back Converter Output Spikes, and it is based on a real case. I'd like to thank Audit for the support in the preparation of this presentation. And there is a disclaimer here that the commercial products that are shown in this presentation are for educational purposes only. There is no endorsement or recommendation implied for these devices. So I'm talking about a buck converter, which is based on this controller LM5085 of Texas Instrument. That's a constant on-time controller with an external switcher. This is a P-channel transistor. And there is a diode. It's a short key diode. We have the inductor. This arrangement is to actually generate a ripple here in this case because the control is based on ripple sensing. I'm not going into it because this is not really the subject of this presentation. There is a video on constant on-time controller that you can watch in my YouTube channel. So this is the controller. This is the transistor diode. Here is the output, and this is the filter for the output, and we have a filter to the input. Now this is a actual implementation of this circuit that I'm discussing here. Uh, this is the controller now. Here we have a bank of uh, capacitor at the input. I'm not discussing all this section, which has to do with uh, current sensing, uh, overcurrent uh, protection, and some filtering for the uh, driver, for the power supply of the driver. This is a PMOS, so we need a negative going with respect to the source, negative going pulse. This is now the inductor. This is the Schottky diode. Well, there is a snubber here, which is, not, again, not relevant to what we are talking about. And we have the output filters. We have here two 22 microfarad capacitor plus a 0.1. This is the divider for the feedback. So this is the buck converter running at 200 kilohertz. So it's a five microsecond uh, period. The on for 50 volt input and 5 volt output is about 0.1 for the 50 volt input. So the on time is about uh, 500 nanoseconds, half a microsecond. So this is the circuit. Now, looking at the design, I have the inductor so I can calculate the ripple current of the inductor which this is the delta I, this is the voltage during the off time, diode voltage plus the output voltage times the T off time, which is 4.5 microsecond. I come up with 0.75, which is fine. I didn't mention that the buck converter is designed for three to four amps. And now if we're talking about the ripple that I'd expect at the output, this is the output ripple across the capacitors, then I can calculate it by looking at the amount of charge that the capacitor are being charged and then later on, of course, uh, discharged. And this uh, can be calculated by knowing the delta I and the, this is half the period. And then this area is the charge and therefore, I come up with 0.47 micro, this should be Coulomb, and this comes out to be 10 millivolt. So the expected ripple here is really uh, very small, so there is no problem in that. However, as the device was turned on, here is what we observed. Uh, these are, this is the 5 volt, and we have these spikes, which are, well, some of them are reaching 500 millivolt, half a volt, and even more. Uh, this is another area in the board, which is not relevant here. This is the output. This is the 5 volt output of the DC-DC converter. Very, very noisy, spiky. And in order to make sure that we don't have a problem of a common mode, we ran, of course, a common mode measurement that is putting the tip of the probe of the oscilloscope, this is, goes to the oscilloscope, and the ground at the ground side. And then this is the measurement and compare the two. Obviously, this does not represent the actual uh, size or distances in the circuit, 
but this is just the concept of the common mode measurement. And if I compare the two, I see that the common mode, uh, well, there's certainly common mode, but the measured signal is really much higher. So it's real. I mean, it's not just noise, something injected into the measurement, an artifact. No, it is a real noise at the output. And if I now look at it a little bit more carefully, I see that these are very sharp spikes, very sharp spikes. And, and I open it, here is what I got uh, for different uh, current actually uh, loading. This is like 0.8 peak to peak pulses, spikes, and this is uh, like 0.6. Well, not, not very good. So the question is now, okay, we've calculated the ripple, everything looks fine. Uh, the ripple should be 10 millivolts, so what is the reason for these spikes? One reason could be the fact that we have not taken into account the ESR. The current through the ESR is triangular, and therefore there is a voltage drop on the ESR, which you will see here. But the ESR of this capacitor, we'll see it later, is uh, the total ESR is something like 2 milliohms. So uh, with a current of 2-3 uh, amp, uh, this should be a couple of millivolts, maybe 5 millivolts. So, so it's much, much lower than what we see. So this is not the reason. There is another possibility, and that is this uh, ESL, the inductance of the capacitor. And as this current is passing here, there is a sharp break in the IDT. Here the IDT positive and here is negative. So here we see a fast change in the VDT and consequently you would expect some pulses here, some pulses here. But again, it's not clear if this is really sufficient to explain what we see. And then we come to realize that the model here is incomplete in that there is a capacitance. This is the inter-winding capacitance of the inductor, the winding of the inductor. Now this is of course a very crude model. It's one capacitor. In reality, we have many capacitors here, but experience has shown that this model is, is pretty good to analyze and explain uh, most of the phenomena that we see in grid circuits. So now we understand that we do have a problem like this. Here it is. This is the capacitance. This is the inductance. And we have here a step function when this thing is switching between V in and just about ground voltage on the diode. So this is the circuit we are talking about now. This is like the resistance of the circuit. This is the capacitance of the inductor. And here is the inductance of the capacitor. The capacitor itself for this phenomena can be considered a short and the inductor itself can be considered a open circuit. So as I feed in a signal and it has some rise time to it and they are these breakpoints of the DVDT, then obviously this thing is going to oscillate. That is, I'm injecting high frequency components into the circuit and the circuit will start to oscillate and I'd expect to see something like this and something like this. And this is probably the reason uh, for what we see in the actual circuit. So I'm going back now and to look at the inductor to see what we are talking about in terms of this capacitance. Now the value of the capacitance is not given. This is the inductor, 33 microhenry. This is the Burns inductor. But what we have here is the self-resonant frequency. So this is the self-resonance between this capacitor and the inductor, assuming a model of a parallel combination, as we have assumed. So therefore, if this self-resonant frequency is uh, here, we know the inductance, we know the 5 megahertz, that's from the table here. So we come up that this capacitance is about 30 picofarad. Okay? So this is something we have to take into account. Now I'm going back a little bit to the capacitor. This is a ceramic capacitor. We had two 22 microfarad capacitor. 
So the first thing I like to look at is how is this capacitance affected by the DC bias? This is a 25 volt capacitor and lo and behold at 5 volts, which is the output voltage on the output capacitor, it's already 50% down. So we don't have a 22, we have actually 11 microfarad per capacitor. This means that the ripple that we've calculated is incorrect and it'll be higher. Well, it'll be twice the value we calculated, which is again a fairly low value. That's not explaining anything or any of the spikes. And then I probe a little bit deeper into this capacitor and I see here is the impedance. This is the resonance now point between the capacitor and the self-inductance. And notice that under voltage, and that's very nice, that Murata, this is uh, the Murata company, and they have this simulator that you can change the bias on the capacitor and see the effect of it. And indeed, there is an effect. You see, first of all, the fact that the capacitance is changing because you see here, the impedance here is higher than here because the capacitor here is, is smaller. And also there is some shift in the resonant frequency because of course the capacitance is changing. And here it's about uh, two megahertz, 1.5 megahertz. At any rate, I can use this information to get the actually inductance. One more point, the ESR also given by this uh, simulator very nicely, this is zero volt, this is five volt, and you will see there is a slight increase in the ESR under bias. This is something that uh, we have found in some studies we have done, actually I've written a paper on that. So the ESR is a little bit increasing because the capacitance is being reduced. The change is not very much, but there is a slight change and we see that under five volt, it's about still something like three milliohm, which again is very nice. So now I'm ready to do some simulation. I've put here a P-channel transistor, which is about the type that we've been using. That's not exactly the kind because I couldn't find a model of it and I didn't want to bother building a model or importing a model. And I'm driving it from a voltage source, but I've put here 6 ohm in order to emulate the 1 amp current capability of the IC that we've seen before, I mean the controller. It's about 1 amp, a little bit higher. And here we have the inductor and uh, I'm assuming a current of uh, 2.5 amp. And now I've put already 11 micro and I've put here some extra inductance just uh, for the interconnection, uh, just to be on the same side that I'm taking into account the more parasitic. And this is the what I'm getting in the simulation for the output voltage without a capacitor here. That is assuming just an inductor. And indeed, what you see is very typically, this is the ripple and it's about 22 millivolt peak to peak. That's very close to what we have calculated. Very, very close. So it's really consistent. There are no spikes. Actually, there are some spikes here in this transition. As I've said, as the current is, the, the IDT is changing, even here, this is where the uh, change is. There is some disturbance, but that's not explaining any of the high spikes that we have seen. Now I am putting in more accurate parameters for the inductor and the capacitor. So the inductor is 33 micro Henry, 50 milliohm resistance, that's not important. Also there is a parallel resistance, not important. This is important. I've put here 30 picofarad, although I've seen that some model for this particular inductor have used 45 picofarad, but I actually uh, put a low value just to see what will happen. And then for the capacitor, we have 11 microfarad per capacitor, and then we have a 5 milliohm, it's a little bit higher than we found, and I've put here one 
nano Henry, although I've calculated it to be like 0.6, I'll just for the interconnection, I've added, boosted up to one nano Henry. And here is what we see. This is the gate voltage. This is the midpoint, the midpoint between the transistor and the diode, switching between zero and 50 volt. This is the inductor current going up and down, up and down. And here is the output. And indeed, we do see these spikes now. This is the duration of the on time. We see a spike here and see a spike here. It really depends on the sharpness of these pulses. Obviously, it also has to do with the way I've defined uh, this pulse here and also how much current do I, we have to feed the gate. Anyhow, we do see the phenomenon. This is exactly the problem. Now, looking up a little bit closer, let's go start from here. We see very nicely the plateau here during the Miller effect duration. This is now the rise time of the midpoint between the diode and the transistor. And here we see the disturbance. There are too many oscillations. There's one here, but we see that it's, it's quite sizable. It's 224. Now, obviously, if I change the capacitor, change the inductor, I can match these, but that's not the point. The point is that this really, this capacitor of the inductor explain these spikes. And now, if I change the gate resistance, slowing down the transistor, this is 4 ohm and this is 50 ohm, the gate resistor or the p-channel, we see that the 4 we have, you know, this is 0.5 and here is the spikes. And indeed, if I slow down the gate, the transistor, I see the spikes are much, much smaller. This is the same scale here, so comparison can be made here. So we see that this is really a big difference here. Other than that, things look just about the same. So the question, what could be done? Well, other than changing the circuit itself to, so as to minimize these spikes, which of course, if we have a inductor with a lower capacitor, lower inductances, we could do that, or we can filter out this voltage so that the load will not see these spikes. So one way to do that is to add a ferrite bead here between say this point and this point. I've put it just between these two capacitors. I'm showing this just a demonstration. By no means is this optimized. This is just chosen as a, you know, one ferrite bead of many just for the demonstration. So don't take it as an optimal or best design. Now the parameters are of the bead are given here. And by the way, we, I do have a video on ferrite beads in my YouTube channel. So you can have a look on what's all about the ferrite beads. And here we have the information about this particular ferrite bead. This is 75 nano Henry. Uh, what is important is the impedance at 100 megahertz is 34. This is the impedance that actually will be doing the filtering. And another parameter of interest, of course, is the series resistance is 10 million, which is okay, a little bit high for, say, 4 amp, but not too bad. It's sort of very marginal. So as I have said, this is just one bead that I've picked just to show the effect. And here is what we see. This is the output before the bid. What we notice here is in this particular case, again, this is just for this particular bid, we see an increase in the spikes. This is before here, this is here. Because of this, the ferrite bead, because of the inductive nature of it, we got actually higher spikes here. So this is not so good and obviously by looking for other beads and be able to get a better result. But what I like to show 
is what we get after the bid. We have a very good filtering here. This is the voltage after the bid. Total is 66 millivolt. This is peak to peak, including the major ripple and the sharp pulse, which are now very, very small. And they're in the order of uh, 20 millivolt, which is okay. So what I've shown is a reason for spikes at the output of a buck converter, not always recognized as a problem, and that is the capacitance of the inductor. And also I've shown a way to filter it out with readily available component that is uh, ferrite beads. So this brings me to the end of this uh, presentation. I thank you very much for your attention. I hope you will find it of interest and perhaps it will be useful to you in the future. Thank you very much.